Okay. Why don't we begin? Hi, everybody. Let's see how many we got here. Uh, most of you. Um, I'm sure the others will show up, hopefully, uh, soon enough. So, uh, welcome back. Um, we have today's lecture four, and um, let's just remember what we've been doing. Um, in the last few lectures, we were exploring uh, the regular languages as described by finite automata and regular expressions. We showed how to convert them back and forth, uh, those two models to one another. And we also showed how to prove certain languages are not regular. Now remember, finite automata are a very um, weak model of computation. They only have a limited memory, a finite memory, um, and uh, they still are an, able to do certain things with their finite memory, but um, uh, they are, uh, you know, um, if you compare them with a general purpose computer, at least the way we think about it, um, is uh, their, uh, you know, their capabilities are just extremely limited. And so we're going to, over the next uh, few lectures, explore uh, some more powerful models. Uh, we started doing that last time, uh, the context-free grammars. And as we'll see, there are certain things that you can do. I think we saw that last time as well. There's certain, some things you can do with context-free grammars that you cannot do with finite automata. And, uh, but they still have their limitations, as we'll see. Um, so, um, Today, what we're going to do, uh, we're going to continue that discussion uh, by uh, looking at the definition of context-free grammars in a more formal way. Uh, one of the uh, things that we do in this course is develop a practice with formalism, and um, so that, that, that's going to be in the spirit of that. We also are going to look at their associated languages called the context-free languages, so, so they're going to be the counterpart for context-free grammars of what the regular languages are for the uh, finite automata regular expressions. And then we're going to look at a, an automaton based model, which is the counterpart to the uh, grammars called the pushdown automata. And we'll see that those are equivalent in power. And finally, um, well, and, and as part of that, we will show how to convert the context free grammars to the pushdown automata. And that's what, that's what, that's what we're going to do today. So we're going to move on then and uh, return to uh, our topic of context-free grammars uh, that we began last time. And just to refresh your memory, um, so here was that example of a context-free grammar that we gave uh, last time. And um, it has, uh, the way we're going to be writing context-free grammars is using a bit of a shorthand, uh, which looks like this. When you have multiple rules that have the same variable, on, this, on the left-hand side, you can combine them into one line. Uh, so these two rules over here, s goes to zero, s1, and s goes to r, can be written in one line as a little bit more compact way, this is standard, uh, as s goes to zero, s1, or r. That's where you would read this. This is really two rules, but written on one line. Okay, so uh, as you recall uh, from last time, a context-free grammar has terminals, variables, and rules. Uh, those are the parts uh, that we, we uh, speak of, as well as one of the variables being designate, designated as a starting variable, where, which gets the whole thing going. So I'll talk, remind you about how that computation goes. But um, so the uh, variables are the symbols that appear on the left-hand side of the rules. The terminals are the other symbols uh, that appear in the uh, grammar, and um, uh, uh, the, um, uh, we uh, take the grammar and we use it to generate strings according to a certain uh, system. And the system is that you start out by writing down the, the uh, starting variable. And then once you've written down that variable or whatever variables you have written down, you're allowed to substitute them according to the rules, uh, the substitution rules that are in the grammar. Uh, so you can keep on replacing the variables that you have with the corresponding right-hand sides, and then uh, you do that over and over again until you don't have any variables left. Only terminal symbols remain. And at that point, you have generated a string that's in the language of the grammar. 
All right. So the grammar's language is going to be uh, a language over strings whose alphabet are the terminal symbols. So the terminal symbols, in a certain sense, play the same role as the input alphabet, say for the finite automata. Okay, uh, the, the, the variables are kind of internal working um, symbols for the grammar. The terminals are sort of, uh, are, are, are the symbols over which the language is, is written. Okay, we'll make that more precise in a minute where I, when I give the formal definition. So the result is the generated string and the language of the grammar is the language of all generated strings that, that you can get using that grammar. So, um, and the important thing is that we call that language a context-free language. Okay, so the, that's like what we get from, that, that's the analogous thing to the regular languages, but here we call them context-free languages, uh, the things that you can get from a context-free grammar. Again, just a quick recap of that example we did last time. Um, so you start out by writing the start variable, and then uh, I'm going to give you kind of two views of that, either in terms of the tree of substitutions, which we call the parse tree, or in terms of the resulting string as you do the substitutions. So here is the uh, parse tree, here is the resulting strings, here are the substitutions that you make, um, and now we have R um, coming from S, and we have 00R11, and now we have uh, R in turn becomes an F, empty string, and then uh, the string that we generated is 0011. That's in the language of the grammar. And now uh, if you play with this a little bit, you'll see that the language of the grammar is all strings that look like runs of zeros followed by runs of ones. All right, so uh, is that clear? Um, I think we're gonna have a, um, I think the next uh, slide is gonna have a check-in, and so uh, hopefully that'll uh, get us uh, all together on the same page with this. Anyway, um, so here's our formal definition anyway. Uh, we have a context-free grammar is a four-tuple. There are four parts to a context-free grammar. These are the parts we've already been discussing, uh, the variables, the terminal symbols, the rules. Um, the rules are always of the form a variable uh, followed by, you know, with an arrow to a string of variables and terminals. That's the way we write, just write that down. So this is the form of the rule. And then we have the special start variable. And we all wrap that up into a package, this four tuple. That's what the context-free grammar is. Um, now we have here, uh, and now maybe a little bit overkill, but let's talk about what, formally speaking, what the, the way the grammar actually processes um, and produces strings. Um, so we're gonna write uh, the, the standard notation for this is that if you have two strings of variables and terminals, so let, imagine you have an intermediate string that you've generated in the grammar so far, um, you know, which might be like 00S11 from the previous slide. So that's an intermediate string that is so far what you've generated. You're gonna say, um, may, maybe that's U and V might be the next line down. Uh, so that means we're gonna write U arrow V and that arrow is, 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 is the, the word we're gonna use is yields. We'll say U yields V. Um, if it can go from U to V just with one substitution step. Um, and then we'll write, U yields V in some number of steps, or actually we say U derives V, if it can go to U to V with some number of substitutions instead of just one. And that's used with the, um, the yields arrow with the star above it to mean some number of. Um, another way of writing that is you can say U goes to V if there are a bunch of one step moves that you can make, which take you from U to V. And that whole sequence is called a derivation of V from U. That's a sequence of steps that you go through doing these substitutions one by one to take you from U to V, according to the rules of the grammar. And lastly, if U is a starting variable, then we call that sequence 
just the derivation of v. It could be the derivation from the start variable, but that's kind of the assumed, if you don't say it's a derivation from anything, the derivation of v in the grammar is the derivation of v from the start variable. It's just the sequence of substitutions that you make. Kind of the, you know, what you, was, uh, what, what I think you would expect. And now the language of the grammar is the set of all strings that, um, of terminal symbols that you can get from uh, starting at the starting variable of the grammar. Okay, and that's called a context-free language, as I mentioned before. So it's a context-free language. It's the language of, of the grammar for some grammar. Okay, so let's have a little check in here. Again, nothing too hard, nothing to get worried about anyway. We're not counting correctness uh, here. So um, let's just see. Um, I'm gonna give you two uh, things that look like grammars. Which of them are actually grammars? And let me just pull that poll up uh, here. Okay, so which of these are valid grammars here? Are they both? Neither? I mean, you can kind of make an argument either, you know, either way for both of them, but both of them are kind of a little, have their own a bit of weirdness to them uh, in a way, if you, if, you, if you study them for a second. Um, okay, that's pretty much converged. Um, share the results. Um, okay, so, um, so in fact, the correct answer is B. Um, and uh, why is only C2? What, well, first of all, you know, well, what's wrong with C1? C1, the problem with C1 is that the rules have things besides a single variable on the left-hand side. So having a B1 on the left-hand side is not legal in a context-free grammar. In fact, there are other kinds of grammars. Um, there's a kind of grammar called a context-sensitive grammar. The term context-free means you can replace the variable independent of its context in the intermediate string. So independent of what's around it. But here, th this substitution is going to, you can replace B, but it depends on there being a one next to it. Um, this is called a context-sensitive grammar, but is not the kind of grammar we're going to be using, which are only context-free grammars. So C1 is out. That's not a legit context-free grammar. C2, um, the thing that's a little weird about C2 is if you try to generate a string in C2, you'll see that um, there's no way to get rid of the variables. That you're always gonna be stuck with the variable. Um, now that doesn't violate the definition of a context-free grammar. So this is a context-free grammar, but, it, but it's not gonna be able to generate any strings of only terminals. So this is a context-free grammar whose language happens to be the empty language, but that's totally okay. So the correct answer here is B, that only C2 here is a valid context-free grammar. Okay. Um, common, let's just see. Common question, does a string U derive itself? Y yes, a string U derives itself. Uh, that's a little bit of a, a little bit of an esoteric question there for us right now, but yes. Um, a string U in, in this definition here, U arrow stars U is, legit, is, is legal. Maybe it isn't uh, according to the way I've written it down here, but it is, it is a, a, a legal thing. It's not gonna really matter for you anyway, but, but it is legal. Okay, let's continue. Um, let's do another somewhat interesting example of a context-free grammar. Um, this is a grammar that is, um, can generate arithmetical expressions involving pluses and times. Um, so here it is, it has how many rules? Well, there are six rules here. Each line represents two rules. So E goes to E plus T or T, T goes to T times F or F, and F goes to uh, parenthesis E parenthesis or A. Um, and now, so the, Variables are gonna be the symbols that appear on the left-hand side, E, T, and F. The terminal symbols, which are gonna be the symbols of the language that you're gonna be generating, um, is gonna be the plus, the time symbols. The parentheses are just terminal symbols here, so they're nothing, not playing any special role besides that. 
And then you have the A, which is representing kind of the um, operand on which those operators uh, would be working if there was actually an expression you would use, but they're just symbols from the perspective of the, of the grammar. And lastly, the start variable is going to be as normally uh, appears on the upper left-hand side um, of the uh, grammar in terms of the way you write it down. Um, so sometimes you might specify a different start variable, but otherwise, if not specified, it's, that, it's the one in this corner here. Okay, so let's just see uh, some examples of uh, using the grammar to generate uh, a string. So here is a string in the language, a plus a times a. And, and this example will kind of reveal some other interesting features uh, of the grammar, but let's just see it in operation first. So again, I'll try to write it to you in both ways in terms of the parse tree and the resulting string as you're doing the substitutions. So, um, the, uh, so first we start with the E, then we substitute E plus T, and we see the resulting string is E plus T. But now we, as we're doing additional substitutions, the resulting string that you get is going to evolve um, accordingly. And um, so I hope it comes across that this tree here picture on the left shows you the structure of the various substitutions, whereas on the right, it just shows you the strings that you get as a result of those substitutions. Um, so now you can uh, generate this particular string, which is now in the language of this grammar. You could generate all sorts of other strings as well, uh, such as you know, parenthesis a plus a, parenthesis times a, and so on. And in fact, um, this might be a piece of a programming language that you're trying to describe. Um, and one application of context-free grammars is to describe the syntax of programming languages. You know, what, what are the legal programs um, that you can write with, uh, in that programming language? And not only that, uh, the a grammar can be used to automatically generate the part of the compiler uh, for that programming language, which will interpret the um, which which will uh, interpret the structure of the input, you know, the so-called parser, which will figure out the meaning of the uh, input to the compiler, so that the compiler then can generate the code, or it's, if it's an interpreter, it can interpret the uh, the resulting um, code that you've given it. Um, but the very first step in both of those is to figure out the meaning. And the meaning is um, embedded within the structure of the parse tree. Now, in the, in the case of this particular tree, just to give you some sense of what meaning I have in mind, um, this parse tree, due to the structure of this grammar, has the precedence for times over plus. So normally when we write down a plus a times a, you, you assume you're going to do the multiplication before you do the addition, even though it appears second. That's just the way we tend to write things. And, and this grammar has grouped it that way for you. It groups the times lower down in the tree than the plus. So the, the times is gonna be done before the plus, if you imagine doing this in terms of the way it, the tree is guiding you. So the tree, as you can see, has a certain amount of meaning built into it. Now we're not actually gonna be using that in this course, but I just want to uh, describe that as a, an illustration of how this material can get applied. Um, now, so you know, here is what I'm saying, that the tree contains additional information. Um, now, that's also relevant um, if you happen to have a grammar which might allow multiple parse trees for the same string. Okay, that can happen. Um, it ha in this particular grammar does not allow that, but you might write other grammars that, as we'll see in a minute, that could generate the same string in multiple ways with multiple different parse trees. Now that might be undesirable when you have a programming language because typically you want it to be only a single meaning for your code. You don't want it to be ambiguous and have multiple meanings. But, um, uh, Ambiguity is, does occur, and it's not necessarily something we're always going to uh, see as a bad thing. 
Um, so, you know, I think as I mentioned last time, a lot of this subject originated with linguistics. Um, and that's where the terminology comes from, grammar and um, uh, languages and so on. Um, the terminology for the subject really comes out of linguistics. Um, in fact, one of the key players for that is an emeritus faculty member at MIT, Noam Chomsky. He was instrumental in setting a lot of this stuff up. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, you, you can think of grammars as applying to natural human languages as well. So I, I, let me give you a little example as a pop-up. This is not directly a uh, pop-up check-in, not directly relevant uh, to the material I just presented, but just sort of a, a curiosity. Um, if you take the English sentence, the boy saw the girl with the mirror. Um, you know, does that, is there only one natural uh, interpretation for that sentence or are there perhaps other inter natural interpretations for that sentence? So let me pose that to you as another uh, poll here. Um, and uh, so I ask you to think about how many different meanings you might find for uh, reasonable different meanings. I mean, you can, you know, if you're gonna go wild, you can think of zillions of meanings, but I think in terms of reasonable meanings, how many meanings might you get for the sense? Uh, people are seeing more meanings than I'm seeing, um, but that's okay. Um, so this is uh, quick. Why don't we just give this another uh, uh, 10 seconds here. Um, and then um, most of you are in agreement with me. Um, uh, I can see here that uh, uh, you are uh, seeing that there were two meanings. The two meanings that I see here for the sentence are um, when you say the boy saw the girl with the mirror is who has the mirror? Is it the boy seeing the girl through the mirror? Or is it the girl that has the mirror and the boy just happens to see her? So two very different meanings for the same sentence. And that's sort of the nature of English is just uh, the, the way um, uh, it's, it's, an, it's, it's an ambiguous um, structure there. And often we resolve that ambiguity in English with other information that we might have. Um, but um, typically you don't want there to be ambiguity when you have this a grammar, say, describing a programming, la programming language. Okay. Um, so let's continue on then. Um, so talking a little bit more about ambiguity, I was promised you an example where you might have an ambiguous grammar. Um, so uh, if you take these two grammars, G2 and G3, G2 from the last slide and G3 is a, a similar uh, grammar. In fact, has, it's the grammar that has the very same language um, that gives you the very same language. So L of G2 equals L of G3. Both of them are describing these arithmetical expressions. Um, but whereas G2 has a unique parse tree for every string that you generate, G3 can have multiple parse trees for the same string. Okay, so I'm just gonna illustrate that here. So here is the same string that we generated last time, A plus A times A. In G3, the parse tree is actually even simpler here. Um, so here I'm showing you the, uh, the, just the two substitutions that you uh, need to make starting from E and then uh, to, to get uh, the string A plus A times A, it's a, it's a, it's a simpler grammar in a sense. Um, but you, there's another parse tree that'll give you the same uh, result. And I've written that down below here, upside down. Um, so uh, the upper parse tree groups the times before the plus, or more, you know, more inside uh, than the plus, but the lower parse tree doesn't have that precedence built into it and can alternatively interpret the plus as being of higher precedence than, than times. And so in that sense, we have here um, a grammar which is, um, has two interpretations for this um, same string. And we call that, whoops, we call that an, an, an ambiguous uh, derivation, an ambiguously de derived string. And the grammar itself is called an ambiguous grammar. Um, uh, okay, uh, so let us continue on from that. Um, by the way, I, there's a question here that came in. Uh, uh, like, for example, A plus A, is that ambiguous in G2? No, 
if you if you try to uh, apply it, you'll see the way that G2 can produce A plus A, to, A plus A plus A is going to group the first two and then the and then the, the second one, then the, then the last one. You can't you can't derive things in in multiple ways. Um, I mean, addition is associative, but the grammar doesn't, it, it, it doesn't, the grammar, for the grammar, um, it, it's going to have a prescribed order uh, for the way things get interpreted there. Okay, um, so that's ambiguity. Um, so let's uh, introduce pushdown automata, um, which is going to be our automata counterpart for context-free languages. All right. Um, so the way I'm going to introduce pushdown automata, uh, sort of shifting gears here and now, um, is by first uh, giving a new view of finite automata. Remember before, when we presented a finite automaton, we gave it in terms of a state diagram, which I've kind of shown here in miniature form on the picture. Um, uh, we could do that for pushdown automata, but the picture tends to be very complicated. So I'm going to take a bit of a higher level um, uh, description for pushdown automata, which is I'm, I'm calling a schematic view or a schematic diagram. And there I'm really not going to be showing you the individual states, but I'm going to be showing you the individual components of the machine at a sort of more of an abstract, uh, and from a more abstract perspective. And so from that perspective, um, a, uh, a finite automaton has here what I'm going to call the finite control. So I'm going to be suppressing the details of the states in, in, this, pic in this picture. I'm going to represent uh, that those states as the control of the, um, of the DFA or the NFA. They're really going to be the same um, from this uh, pictorial point of view. Um, the input is going to be appear on as a string that's written down on what we're calling a tape. Again, this is somewhat of an anachronistic terminology. Back in my days, people actually did feed their inputs into computers on a tape sometimes. We don't do that so much anymore, but that terminology has stuck and is going to be persisting um, uh, later on in the course too, so you might as well get used to it. Um, so the input is going to appear on a tape or sometimes called an input tape. Um, and the way the um, machine actually will read that input, whoops, uh, is going to have a head, which is going to be um, starting at the left side and moving from left to right, reading the symbols on the, that appear on the input tape one by one. Okay, so this is our picture of a, an, a finite automaton, just redone from uh, last time, just a different way of picturing it. Now that's going to be setting the stage for the picture of a pushdown automaton, because a pushdown automaton is like a finite automaton, but it has an extra feature, has an extra device attached to it, and that's called a stack. Okay, so here's a schematic diagram for a pushdown automaton, and that's going to be a stack, which is going to be basically a form of auxiliary storage. Now remember, part of the limitation for a finite automaton was that we had a um, limited amount of memory. Um, so um, we were not able to do some very simple things like counting because we had a limited memory. So the pushdown automaton is going to be able to use its stack as a kind of unbounded memory, but a, a memory that's very restricted in the way it can be used. So it's unlimited, but still restricted, as we'll see. So uh, the way the pushdown automaton uses um, this uh, extra memory on, the, on what we're calling the stack or a pushdown stack is that you can write symbols um, instead of only reading symbols, but those symbols can only be read at the very, written or read at the very top of this list of symbols. And every time you add a new symbol, the other symbols that are already there get pushed down, hence the name. People also often refer to it as a stack of plates uh, in a cafeteria, if you've ever seen those things, or you can remember back to the days when we went to cafeteria, uh, which is getting further and further away. But um, 
uh, even at the cafeteria, you had a stack of plates and you know, you, as you remove plates from them, they were, were on a spring and they kept coming up or if you add more, they would go down. And it's the same idea. Imagine these symbols here are sort of on a, um, on a spring and the more symbols you add, the, the more they go down. Uh, or if you remove them by read and read them and remove them, then they move back up, okay? So a pushed out automaton operates like a finite, like a non-deterministic finite automaton, as we'll see, pushed out automata for, our, for us are always going to be allowed to be non-deterministic. So we're not going to be studying the pushed out automata that are restricted to be only deterministic. Um, uh, I'll, I'll say more about that in a second, but like they operate like an NFA, except they can write uh, or read symbols from the top of the stack. And when they write, they're adding the symbol on, pushing down that stack. And when they're reading, they're removing symbols from the stack and thereby lifting up the stack, okay? We give them special names. So those of you who have seen stacks already, this is, you know, I'm sure old hat for you, uh, but I'm sure not all, everyone has, has seen stacks before. So uh, the special name for writing onto a stack is called a push operation so that you're pushing a new symbol down on the top of the stack and it pushes everything down. Whereas when you're reading a symbol and removing it from the top of the stack, that's called a pop. So that's reading and removing. And we, we always think of those as going together, writing and adding and reading and removing are combined. I mean, you might wonder, well, why can't I just read it and leave it alone and not just have it, remove it? You, uh, no, you can get that effect, by reading it and then, uh, which removes it and then putting it back if you really want it to stay there. Um, but the way we're setting it up is that reading comes with removing, writing comes with adding. Okay, and they're called pushing and popping. Okay, so let's do an example. Um, so we have here a push on automaton for a language we'll call D. It's a, we've seen that language before, it's this, uh, it was um, actually, we used the same uh, letter for it, the strings of zeros followed by ones where the numbers are the same of the two. So zero to the K, one to the K. We couldn't do that with a finite automaton. We will be able to do that with a push down automaton. Um, and here I, uh, um, I thought I wrote down the input here, but okay. So the basic idea is I'm gonna give you a, uh, an input now, and the push down automaton is supposed to test whether that input is in the language, whether it's of this form. Um, now it has the ability to use the stack because you know it's going to have to count how many zeros it has. And so the way it's going to do it is that you know have a bunch of zeros, hopefully, and then a bunch of ones, and you want to see that they're uh, of the same number. It's going to take the zeros and store them on the stack until it sees a one. And then one's gonna to start to read the ones and it's gonna remove the zeros, matching them off one to one with the ones that it's seeing. Okay? So um, you initially first read the zeros and push them onto the stack until you read a one. And then you read the ones uh, while uh, popping zeros from the stack and you enter the accept state if the stack is empty. Just like with a finite automaton, the accept, entering the accept state only counts when you're at the end of the input. Okay, so um, without even need, needing to say anything, it's really saying you enter the accept state if the stack is empty at the end of the input string. But that's kind of implicit because it only takes effect at the end of the input string. If you enter an accept state along in the middle somewhere, it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect anything. Um, okay. Uh, and with that, we're going to take a little break, and then we'll be back uh, shortly to look at push down automata again in a more uh, with a more formal definition. Um, let me put that's going to be five minutes. So if I can figure out how to get my timer screen up here, yes, and we will. Uh, when the cam when the candle burns down to nothing, um, we will return and continue. Okay, our candle has
burned down and has gone out. I, I never actually watched to see what would happen at the end. Uh, so um, we're good to go. Let's continue. Um, uh, good. And let me put myself back in there. All righty. Um, so we were doing push down automata, and we just did that example of zero to the k, one to the k. Now that you have a stack, we can do uh, all sorts of fancy things that finite automata could not do um, just with their limited uh, memory. Okay, so let's take a look at how we define push down automata. Um, so now uh, push down automata is actually gonna be a six tuple. So it's a little bit, got some fancier stuff here to deal with. Not too much, but a little bit. Um, and uh, so it has, uh, let's look at these a little bit more carefully since there's some novelty here. We have the uh, input alphabet, just as we had before, uh, sigma. But we also have gamma, which is the alphabet for uh, using the stack. Now, um, you might ask, why don't we just use the same alphabet? Well, it's really a matter of convenience um, that we would like to be able to have um, uh, other symbols that uh, could include the input alphabet, but could include other things as well. So it just gives you more flexibility in terms of what you're going to be writing on the stack. Um, okay, the transition function, more complicated. Uh, so I, I think, I don't know if I'm going to even say what the other things are, but you know, these are the accepting states. This is the starting state. So that's um, the same as before, but the transition function is a, is a mu much different animal here uh, in a push down automaton. So let's just try to uh, unpack that and understand what it's saying. So the, under, the transition function tells us how the machine operates, how it goes from state to state, um, how it's going to read the input, how it reads the, from the stack, and what it might write on the stack too, because that's going to all happen under program control. So um, what this means here is that, you know, when the machine is in a particular state, um, reading a particular input symbol, let's ignore the empty string uh, subscript for the moment. So it's in a particular state, reading a particular in input symbol, and with a certain stack symbol appearing at the top of the stack. So that's all information that's available to the controller of this push down automaton, the, the transition function. Um, the current state, the next input symbol, and the symbol at the top of the stack. And once we have that, we know what new state we can go into and what new symbol we can write on the top of the stack. Okay, so that's what the uh, um, right-hand side of this uh, function specification means. So this is where uh, kind of the input to the function, this is going to be the output of the function, state and, and, and new symbol to appear on the stack. So this is the popping symbol, this is the pushing symbol. So now there are two things that bear explanation here, first of all. Now, this is, this is a power set. So this is going to be representing, as we did before, um, a non-deterministic machine. Uh, we may have several possibilities, and we're going to represent that as a set of possibilities uh, for the machine that it could go to at any point. I will give an example of how a pushdown automaton uses its non-determinism in a minute. The other thing is, is these epsilons. So we have to understand why they are there. And we remember we had them for the NFAs corresponding to when the NFA had an epsilon transition, an empty transition. So it could go along that transition without reading any input. So this is going to play the same role here. So if you have, um, instead of an input symbol from sigma appearing in this um, uh, part of the, you know, uh, for, for, the, for, for the transition function, instead you have an, uh, you have an epsilon appearing, that means that the transition, that, that move of the machine can happen without reading any input symbol. Just like for the NFAs. 
or if you have an epsilon appearing for the stack symbol, that means you can make that transition without reading any stack symbol. So any, whatever is sitting on the top of the stack, it's, it doesn't matter. The machine can make that move um, and it won't read anything either. We're not gonna pop anything. It's just gonna uh, be proceeding without looking at the stack at all. Or it might have both of them, which case it's gonna go from one state to another state without looking at the input or at the top of the stack. So um, that's what the possibility of epsilon means for, uh, the, um, for, for the transition function in, the, in those places. The epsilon appearing over here means something a little different, but very similar. What that means is that um, we won't write anything on the top of the stack. That's gonna be, uh, we, we will go to a new state, but without doing any writing. So we'll leave the stack alone. Um, so here means we're not, we're not gonna read anything. If, if it's in this position, in this position means we're not gonna write anything. Okay, so all of those things are valid and legal from the perspective of you know, constructing a push down automaton. And I've kind of illustrated here, you know, just with a little bit of an example, if you have delta that applies to some state Q, reading an input symbol A and popping a C from the top of the stack, then you might have, let's say in this case, two possibilities that you might end up going to. You might end up going to states R1 or to states R2. And in the former case, you'll end up writing a D, pushing a D onto the top of the stack. And in the latter case, you would be pushing an E onto the top of the stack. Okay, so this is, I'm trying to help you look at this notation. You again, you know, you know, I hope this is clear to you. Um, I'm sure for some of you, it's too slow, but others of you, I'm trying to help along. But if you're really struggling with this notation at this point, you know, you really have to, gonna have to dig in and make sure you, you follow it, because it's only gonna get harder from that. I'm gonna stop being, uh, going over these, these kinds of points. And if you're, you're still struggling, you can't get it, this is not the right class for you. I'll just, I'll be honest. Um, so we're just gonna be taking off like, you know, we're gonna start to accelerate fairly quickly. Okay, so it's a non-deterministic machine. Um, we accept, uh, like we did before, uh, there might, might be several different threads of the computation. You're gonna end up accepting um, if some of the threads, or one, at least one of the threads, end up, ends up in an accept state at the end of the input string. That's when we machine overall accepts. It's just the way we normally think of non-determinism. Um, again, you can use the models that we had before in terms of guessing or parallelism, whatever works for you. And sometimes different things work in different, different, at different occasions. Uh, but that's how non-determinism works. We'll do an example now. Okay, here is a push on automaton for a different language we haven't seen before, I don't think. Well, maybe we have, um, which is um, going to be using its non-determinism in an essential way. This is a language that is going to, where non-determinism is going to be critical. Um, without it, you can't, uh, a deterministic push on automaton, which is something, by the way, that people study. Um, and there's a section of my book about that, section 2.4, because it has relevance to applications. We're not going to address that in this course. So you can just skip section 2.4. It's pretty technical, uh, I'll have to say. Um, but still uh, quite interesting and beautiful if, you're in, if you like that stuff, but it's technical, uh, we won't do it. Um, so here is um, this input string, WW reverse um, for all possible Ws uh, over our alphabet zero one. And what W reverse by the way means is writing W backwards. Uh, so this is all strings followed by a reversal of the same string, okay, the string written backwards. Um, really, you can think of these as, uh, um, but, you know, these, so these are strings that, um, well, here's an example, like 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, the string written backwards. So this is a string in the language, appearing on a tape, as I, as I described. Okay, so how is the machine going to um, recognize this language? It's kind of be similar, somewhat similar to before, but with one important difference. 
Um, and if you imagine, I think, again, I like to use this kind of anthropomorphizing these things, putting yourself in the place of the machine and thinking how you would do it. Um, so if you imagine getting these symbols one by one, zero, one, one, you don't know what's coming next as you're getting the symbols. Um, you have to figure out how to match off the second half with the first half. So you're going to put the first half on the stack and then um, you're going to remove the first half and match it off with the, with the, with the second half. Uh, con conveniently, the first half comes out backwards. The stack is a first in, last out kind of thing. So um, it comes out in reverse order. So that's perfect for matching off with the second half. Uh, but the tricky part with this language is how do you know when you're at the, when you're at the middle? Because you don't get to see um, the rest. You only get to see what you've seen so far. You don't know what's coming. So, you know, uh, you know, when you read that second one, at this point, you read zero, one, one, now you're reading that second one, you don't know that perhaps there's just going to be a zero following that and it's going to be all. So maybe you should be deciding to that this point here that I've marked um, uh, is the midpoint and you, you, you put zero one on the tape and then start popping the second, the, the, the second one and matching it off with the first one. Um, that, might, that would be a tempting thing to do, but you just don't know. Um, and that's where the non-determinism is going to be essential. So let me, do, let me write down more of this. So what you're going to do is you're going to read and push input symbols, but non-deterministically guessing that you're at the middle. So you're going to non-deterministically either repeat that and continue to read and push symbols onto the stack, or you're going to go to two deciding that or guessing that you're at the midpoint. And now it's time to start reading and popping instead of reading and pushing. So you're going to read input symbols and popping that, popping the stack symbols, comparing the 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 two, the the symbols that you're reading with the top, the symbols you're removing from the stack. If they ever disagree, then this thread of the non-determinism rejects, because either the input is not in the language, or at least you've made a wrong choice as to where the midpoint is. Um, and then you're going to enter the accept state if the stack is empty. And ignore this part for the moment of this software reference. Uh, let's just, um, I'll speak to that in a second. But um, I, I just want to make sure we understand that at intuitive level, how this machine is using its non-determinism to uh, recognize this language. Because the non-determinism is critical and it's important that you understand it. Um, so let me just make some side comments and then we'll come back to this software remark. So first of all, uh, one question that comes up a lot, um, uh, well, I'm not paying attention to the chat here, sorry. So if you're not getting answer from me, try the TAs. But um, one of the, uh, uh, one of the um, questions that comes up a lot when they're thinking about non-determinism for pushdown automata is what happens to the stack? The stack gets replicated in the non-determinism every time the machine forks, just like everything else gets replicated. So an entire, every time there's a fork in the non-determinism and the machine branches into multiple possibilities, the entire machine replicates the current state, the current position of the head, the, what's, uh, the stack and its contents, all of that gets replicated. Um, and the two um, uh, sides of the, the two branches or the two sides of the fork each go on independently in their merry way, okay, doing their own thing independently. And then if any one of them accepts, that's the only way there's sort of a, kind of a communication because the one that accepts raises the flag and then uh, the overall machine is set to accept, okay? So the non-determinism forks replicate the stack. I'm saying it, I uh, just want to make sure you got that. Um, and then this language requires non-determinism that, that, that I said earlier. Um, so our PDA push down time time model is going to be non-deterministic. I mean, you might have examples which are deterministic, but the model is going to always allow non-determinism. Okay, what's this bit about the software? So if you look at this formal definition here, it doesn't have anywhere in it the ability to test if the stack is empty. 
That's not part of the hardware specification, at least as we are describing it for a pushdown automaton. You can might imagine some of, somebody else describes pushdown automata in some other way, which gives that as a primitive, but we're not gonna do that. Why? Because we don't need a primitive for that. You can get the effect of testing if there's an empty stack, even if you don't have that as a primitive for the machine. Because uh, what you could do is you can start the machine off when it, at the very first thing it does is it writes a special symbol to mark um, the bottom, you know, what's going to eventually be the bottom of the stack. There's going to be some special symbol, maybe a dollar sign symbol. Um, that's the very first thing that the machine does. And then it proceeds as before. And if it ever sees that dollar sign symbol again, it knows the stack is effectively empty. Okay, so you can get the effect of testing for the stack being empty, even if you don't have a primitive for that. And we're not gonna actually fuss about some d details like that. Um, so you can use, when you're writing your homework sets, you can just use the, the assumption that you can test for empty stack, which is what I'm gonna do myself. Okay. Um, so uh, let's continue on. Um, all right, so yeah. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna prove our one, so far we really haven't proved anything. We've just given some definitions and some examples. Today was gonna, now we're gonna to come to our big theorem, which actually is um, important and has some meat to it. Um, and that is, how do we convert, you know, I claim that to put context-free grammars and push down automata are equivalent. Well, we're gonna pr prove that equivalence in one direction, converting the grammars to push down automata. Okay, so um, let me show you how that goes. In some ways, um, and it's a nice proof, not super complicated, um, but it has some meat to it. Uh, so if I give you a grammar here, what I'm gonna tell you how to do is convert that grammar into push down automaton, which does the same language. Okay, so if you're checked out for a minute, please come back because we're sort of starting this topic now that you can think a bit about this good, good uh, re-entry point if you've sort of uh, been doing something else, <laughs> which I can't tell, good thing. Uh, so, all right, so converting a given grammar to a push down automaton, how is that gonna work? So the idea is, okay. Actually, before I tell you the idea, let's just think about it together. Again, I like to think about the push down automaton, building a push down automaton the way you would do it. So a grammar is a generation device. It generates strings. A push down automaton, or thinking about it as you, you're a recognizer. You're given an input and you wanna know, is it in the language? So you wanna know, is it possible for that grammar to generate that input you're given. So how are you going, how are you going, to, how are you going to do that? Um, and uh, how, are you, how, are you, how are you going to um, test if the input is in the language of the grammar? Well, the thing that you would naturally do is you say, well, can I derive that string using the rules of the grammar? Let me start with the start string and try to do substitutions and see if I get the string I'm, uh, I'm, I'm given. And if I can get it, then I know it's in the language, right? That's a natural thing to do. You're just gonna try, try, to, do, you know, try to do the substitution, see if you get to the string. Now the thing is, there, are many, there might be many different substitutions that you could make. And you know, that seems like a really challenging, uh, hard thing to figure out which substitutions to use among the many possibilities. That's where non-determinism is gonna come in. Because you can think of yourself as guessing which substitutions to make, and you're always going to make the right guess. So the choices of which substitutions to make, that's not going to be a problem for you. That's going to be managed by the non-determinism. So imagine you're always going to make the right substitution. But now the challenge is, how do you keep track of the intermediate results as you're doing those substitutions? Um, and that's with a stack is gonna come in. The machine is gonna write down those intermediate results on the stack. But even there, there's a subtlety. That's an important uh, subtlety that you have to look at. So let's try pulling that together so far before I get to that subtlety. Uh, okay, so as I mentioned, um, uh, 
the push down automaton is, is going to start out with a starting variable and is going to guess, be guessing the substitutions to make. It's going to keep the intermediate results on the stack. When it's done doing all the substitutions and it has only terminal strings on the stack, it can compare it with the input and see if it got the right thing. So if it made it all the right guesses. So you think of it as guessing, doing the right guesses, but in the end, you have to check to make sure that you got the right, you, you, that you did all the right thing and you accept when, when things um, have matched up, you know, and you, and you made all the right guesses. So you have to, in the end, you have to check that you actually got that input uh, from doing those substitutions. Okay, so let's, let, let, let's try to see this operating in action. And then you'll see the subtlety. The, the, the delicacy, the, 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 a problem that's going to arise. Hopefully you're following at least in part what I'm just saying so far. Okay, so here is the input. We do know that that's an input in the language of the, we've been seeing this example multiple times. So here is the input appearing on the input tape, A plus A times A. Now the push on automaton is supposed to be accepting that input because it's in the language of the grammar. Okay, so it's going to operate by first writing to start off the starting variable on the stack and then doing the substitutions as we're going along. Okay, so um, we're going to substitute, we, 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 uh, E goes to E plus T, so we do that first substitution um, and then we do the next substitution here the E, so I'm, 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 if you're looking at this tree here, I mean, this is the right tree for that, uh, uh, for that input. So we, we substitute E by T. Uh, so far, so good. The automaton can do make that substitution. Then the next substitution is going to be a little, uh, so we're, we're, we're E plus T. We, did the, we substitute here. We got T plus T. And now we're going to substitute the T times F, which is this T over here. We want to substitute that, and that appears as t times f now on the stack. Now, if you're following me, you should be suddenly getting nervous because we just cheated. It's okay um, doing substitution, doing these replacements at the very top of the stack because the pushdown automaton has access to the top. That's how stacks work but it does not have access deep down within the stack. That is, uh, not how stacks, that is not how stacks work. So that's cheating. But ignoring the cheating for the minute, if you could replace those, um, uh, do those substitutions deep down within the stack, this would all work. We would be good. You would do the substitutions uh, one after another until you ended up with no uh, variables. And then you have the string here and you're going to match it off and compare it with the input. It's all done in the right way so that the things are in the right order. Um, so the, you know, the, after all the substitutions, you'd have A plus A times A sitting here on the stack. You match, you compare that with the input. It's going to match up and you'll end up accepting. All good. So how do we deal with that problem here? Problem, access below the stack, top of stack is cheating. What are we going to do instead? So the idea is actually, Pretty simple. Well, if you've understood what I've said so far, the, you know, fixing that is actually not too bad. Um, uh, uh, sort of fading out here. Uh, put some more light on the on my image. Um, so, how do we do that? Uh, how do we get the, the effect of the access below the top of the stack? And the way we're going to do that is. Um, by making the, what we're going to do, we're, we're only going to do substitutions that we can make at the top of the stack. So whenever there's a variable at the top of the stack, we're going to do the substitution because we, the top we can access. Now, what happens if we have a terminal symbol sitting at the top, blocking our way from accessing variable, variables below? Well, actually, that's an easy case to handle because if we have terminal symbols sitting at the top, they're never going to change anyway. So you might as well match them with the input at that time. So when you have a terminal sitting at the top, we'll just read another input symbol and, doing, and, and match it off there. Um, and we just keep reading the terminal symbols off until we have a variable sitting on the top, then we do a substitution. 
Um, and we keep substituting variables until we have a terminal, then we read it, then we compare it with the input. And in so doing, um, we will end up getting the same effect that I described before without ever needing to dig down into the, into the interior of the stack and doing substitutions there. They're all gonna rise up to the top uh, and uh, we can always do them at the top. Okay, um, so anyway, I, you know, I forgot to do that here. So instead, only substitute variables when they're at the top of the stack. Uh, if a terminal's on the top, pop it and compare with the input and reject it if they're not equal. So if you ever have something which is not matching the way it's supposed to, that means that thread's just gonna fail. You know, then there was not a, a bad uh, non-deterministic choice was made, or maybe the input was not in the language anyway, and there were no, no good choices. Um, so here, my, my animation broke here, so let me just uh, put the whole thing up in front of you. So here is the actual construction. Um, push the start symbol on the stack. If the top of the stack uh, is a variable, replace it with a corresponding right-hand side doing a non-determinative choice among the various possibilities. If it's a terminal, you pop it and match it with the next input symbol. And if the stack is empty, you accept. So here is the, how the stack would actually look for this particular input. You know, it would start off the same. You'd have E and then substitute with E plus T. And then um, we're gonna always do the substitutions at the top. So E gets substituted by F. Oh, is that right? No, this slide, I messed up, I apologize. So E gets substituted by T, which gets substituted by F. Um, and the point is, is that when you get to an A sitting at the top, uh, forgive the typos here, um, now we have a terminal symbol and that's gonna get matched off with the next input symbol and get removed. And now we have just the plus and the T left. And then the plus is also a terminal symbol that's gonna get matched off with the next thing. We just have a T sitting on the top and now we can do a substitution. Okay, so that's how uh, it works. Okay, I, that's all I wanted to say, I think. Um, oh yeah, there's one just remark. So this is not, we're not gonna prove this, but I think it's, uh, I, I, I do need to say this, that actually you can do the conversion in the other direction too. You can convert a, um, uh, so A is a context-free language, if and only if some pushdown automaton recognizes A. And um, if you haven't seen if and only if, it's, a, it's an, an expression I'm gonna use uh, uh, again over and over, so you should get used to it. It stands for if and only if, and which just means the implication goes both ways. So A is a uh, context-free context language, implies that some push on automaton recognizes A and vice versa. Um, so there's really two things you need to prove whenever you have an if and only if. You have to prove both directions. Um, so uh, thinking about that way, splitting them in half, um, the, the forward direction we've already proved, converting a push con uh, a context uh, free grammar to a push down automaton, the reverse direction we're not gonna prove. It's in the book if you're curious and you are responsible knowing that the fact is true, but you don't have to know the proof, uh, which is a somewhat, a little bit complicated and you know, I think it would take us too long to go through it, so you're not responsible for it. Um, so there's a last check-in here that I have for you, uh, which is just a question, uh, uh, which you can answer based on the material that we presented so far. Is every regular language also a context-free language? Just yes, no, or you're not sure. Uh, so let me launch that as a poll here. Okay, about to close. Um, ending polling and sharing results. This one, I think uh, you, you pretty much, uh, most of you got, some of you uh, are not sure. Um, every language is in fact a context-free language. Um, and the way to see that is that every regular language can be done by a DFA or an NFA, uh, as we already showed. And, um, a DFA or an NFA is really just a push on automaton that never uses its stack. So uh, you can always think of a, a DFA as a push on automaton, and we already argue that push on automata uh, are equivalent to context free grammars, and so they do the context free languages. So anything that you can do with a DFA, you can also do with a push on automaton, 
and so is therefore uh, um, all the regular languages are also context-free languages. Okay, so with that, let's just uh, kind of pull things together. Um, a little quick recap of so what we've been doing so far in the class. We have the regular languages and the context-free languages. We had the two forms of sort of getting at them, the recognizer form, which is the, like the automata-based perspective, like either a DFA or an NFA in the case of the regular languages, the pushdown automaton for the context-free languages. And for the generators, we had the regular expression uh, for the regular languages and the context-free grammars for the, for the uh, context-free languages, okay? Um, and as we just pointed out in our, most, in our last check-in, the regular languages form a subset, and in fact, a proper subset of the context-free languages uh, as shown in this Venn diagram, because we have already exhibited languages that are context-free, but not regular. All right, um, so quick review. We've defined the context-free grammars and their associated languages, the context-free languages. We defined pushdown automata, and we showed how to convert context-free grammars to pushdown automata. Um, and that's all I have for you today. Okay, here's a question I'll answer to everybody. Why do we restrict ourselves to a stack? Why don't we use random access memory? We will use random access memory um, for the next model uh, called the Turing machine. And we're gonna introduce that, I think next, le next lecture. Uh, so that's going to be the uh, model that we're going to stick with throughout the term. But we have not, uh, we, we were kind of using, introducing weaker models uh, as a kind of a prelude uh, to the more general purpose uh, computational model. Um, uh, really to get ourselves warmed up and also um, because um, for the weaker models, you can fully analyze them. Um, in a way that you cannot for Turing machines. You, you, you will be able to, as you will see, uh, you, know, you, you can um, uh, determine properties of languages for the weaker models that you cannot for the more uh, general models. And so uh, uh, I think that's helpful to have that perspective that you know, for some cases you can get, get a full analysis and some other cases you cannot. Um, but anyway, um, that's the reason why we restrict that, restricted to the stack. Besides the fact that these models have applications um, that I think are worth you people seeing. Um, why, yeah, some reason we chose a stack. Well, why did we choose a stack and not some other data structure for our uh, temporary, for our, 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 our extra storage? And the reason for a stack, for one thing, the stack is, what, is exactly what you need to get you the correspondence with context-free grammars. Um, if you use some other uh, um, storage, like a queue, for example, instead of a stack, in fact, you get a very different outcome. And uh, it's an actually interesting exercise to see what happens. What do you get if you use a queue as an external storage instead of as a stack? Uh, it's a good homework problem. Maybe I'll assign it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, and if a... Okay, uh, we showed so um, we we showed that non-determinism can be eliminated for finite automata. So NFAs and DFAs are equivalent. Uh, what about for for pushdown automata? Uh, the answer is no, they're not equivalent. I think I mentioned that earlier, but I don't mind repeating it. Um, there are certain languages that can be done only with non-deterministic pushdown automata and cannot be done with deterministic pushdown automata. For example, that language WW reverse that requires the non-determinism in order for the machine to be able to guess where the middle is. So, um, okay, uh, I'm gonna head off. Uh, thank you guys. Uh, see you on uh, Tuesday then.